Hello, everyone. Hello. Okay. Apologize for the extra waiting time. You had to uh, stand out there and wait quite a bit. Thank you for your patience. We do have plenty of food, by the way, for those of you who are holding on for the talk and then want to eat later, we're going to keep the food out and you can have some food later. Um, we're so delighted to have all of you here tonight. My name is Penny Wright and many of you we know and many of you we do not know. Thank you all for caring enough about these issues to be here with us tonight. And we know you like lasagna too. <laughs> We are so pleased to have with us one of the country's foremost addiction experts and the author of Glow Kids, How Screen Addiction is Hijacking Our Kids and How to Break the Trance. The, the author is Dr. Nicholas Carderas. In addition to serving as executive director of the Dunes, one of the world's top rehab facilities, he's also a former clinical professor at Stony Brook Medical School and has taught neuropsychology at the doctoral level. He has also worked clinically with over a thousand teenagers over the past 15 years. He is the author of another book written in 2011 titled How Plato and Pythagoras Can Save Your Life, The Ancient Greek Prescription for Health and Happiness. In, in later that year, he came and paid us a visit and talked about this book, and it was really quite a remarkable book. Dr. Carderas is a frequent contributor to Psychology Today. Fox News has appeared on the CBS Evening News, on CNN, Good Day New York, and in Esquire, New York Magazine, and Vanity Fair. He has also spoken about Glow Kids on more than 50 NPR stations. Having worked clinically with over 1,000 teenagers, he's also considered one of the leading experts on technology addiction and the clinical and neurological effects that technology can have on our kids. Glow Kids, published by St. Martin's Press in August, and which Southampton Books has kindly agreed copies to sell out in the hall, is the most comprehensive book ever written on teenage tech addiction. We would also like to thank Dr. Carderas for bringing his family, and they are seated near the piano, his wife, Luz, his twin sons, Alexi and Ari. Please welcome Dr. Nicholas Carderas. Well, thank you for that uh, really nice introduction. I want to thank everybody for being here. I know it's kind of a cloudy, miserable, rainy, humid day, and so I hope, uh, I hope that I uh, provide you with uh, hopefully uh, an informative talk. But obviously, if you're here, you are living in the 21st century and you are concerned about some of the digital effects on technology on children. And as a parent, myself, first and foremost, um, I share those concerns with those of you that are parents. And as a clinician, I share those concerns with somebody who works with different clinical disorders, uh, including addiction. Um, I can say that, like my slideshow, this technology is turning against me. Um, I first became aware of this problem or this potential problem uh, about 10 years ago. And I, I had a young man that was referred to me that was about 16 years old. He was a high school junior and he was sent to my office and he was totally disoriented. He walked into my office, he was blinking his eyes hard, and he kept looking around the room, and he seemed very confused. And I, I asked him, do you know where you are? And he kept blinking and looking around, blinking and looking around. And finally I said to him, do you know where you are? And he said, are we still in the game? And, um, and I took a step back. He, he was suffering from what is psychiatrically known as derealization where a person doesn't know what's real and what's not. Uh, we used to have substance-induced derealization. Uh, we used to think of people that were having psychotic breaks that were from LSD, bad acid trips, and people were actually not able to discern reality from uh, hallucinations. And this young man had been playing World of Warcraft for 10 to 12 hours a day, 
and was in a state of what we later came to call video game psychosis. He had to be sent to Mather Hospital for a month to be psychiatrically stabilized. He was put on antipsychotic medications, and he had a pretty rough time of it. Uh, he had no prior psychiatric history. He had no um, family history of psychiatric issues. It seemed that the primary issue that, was, that he was struggling with was this uh, over-immersion in the screen world. And that's when I first had my, my Houston, we have a problem moment. That's when I realized this, there's something powerful happening here that we're not, um, we haven't been used to generationally. And a lot of people that were in my industry, and again, I'm a mental health provider and I'm an academic, we hadn't seen these kinds of effects before. So I'm not here to say that technology is evil. I'm not a Luddite. Exhibit A, I have my smartphone. I'm a, I'm a believer in technology. But what we are beginning to understand is that we have very quickly, let's say in the last 10 to 12 to 13 years, undergone a seismic shift in our society. And those of us who are of a certain age have seen it. And we haven't fully vetted or understood what some of those consequences are with some of those shifts that we were, we're talking about. So just by a show of hands, I'm, just, I'm curious as to, because obviously those of you that are here have your own opinions about technology and what its impact might be with young people. By a show of hands, how many of you think that there could be some problems with kids being in front of a digital screen for extended periods of time, that there may be some effects to that? Most of you. By a show of hands, how many of you think, ah, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, he's overstated, it's just another medium, uh, it's just like television or radio before it, and maybe maybe this is Pollyannish, and I'm some people like me are overreacting. How many of you think that this is a bunch of bunk and it's just another medium? All right, so most of you are here because you have some concerns about the potential, and, and I, I will stress the potential, because obviously we know there can be healthy technology usage. No one's talking about becoming Amish. I don't think I've seen the Amish in the room. I don't want to offend the Amish. Um, and we're not talking about being Amish, maybe in some ways. But we're talking about raising awareness, and that's really been my mission statement, raising awareness about, because I've been on the clinical front lines and I've done about four years worth of research, and there's been over 200 peer-reviewed studies that have looked at some of these effects of uh, screens and children's brains. And some of them are pretty um, eye-opening. So, let's start off with some humor, some lightness. Here's a little cartoon. And here are a couple of young, a couple of young folks today. Um, so, a bunch of years ago, in 1996, on the cover of Newsweek, they talked about the role of technology in a classroom, what a personal computer can do for education. And back then, you'll see this very sort of idealized, here's the cover of Newsweek in 1996, and here you see this smiling young lady that PC makers get a better student, and that was the promise. That was the promise of technology, that technology can make our children smarter, technology can be educational, technology can be the panacea for a lot of what ailed education. And Newsweek, um, 16 years later, ran a very different cover. This was the news cover in 2012 when we began to see some of the byproducts of what we would consider screen effects. So what are some of these clinical effects I'm talking about? And again, I, I, I want to keep prefacing what I'm saying. Some of these clinical effects don't apply to all children. What we do know, as with any other kind of, let's call them addictive issues, uh, some people are more predisposed than others, and there are certain children based on certain psychological, emotional, environmental issues that are more vulnerable to these effects. So these effects aren't universal. Uh, these effects happen to impact children that already have underlying vulnerabilities more. And the effects that we're talking about are, we, there's been, and we'll talk about these individually as I go on, but we've seen some of the hypnotic, addicting-like effects of technology. We've seen ADHD, attentional impacts. We've seen increased aggression, primarily in video games, uh, anxiety and depression, 
oftentimes associated with social media, and even psychosis, as the young man that I talked to you about. And I'll talk about, there are some very specific studies that have looked at all these clinical disorders as byproducts of excessive screen time. So we began, some of us that were academics and clinicians began to understand that screens were literally, not metaphorically, but literally impacting people as a form of a digital drug. And so this idea of screens being a digital drug was first coined by Dr. Peter Weibrow, who was the uh, head of neuroscience at UCLA, and he started calling them electronic cocaine. Electronic cocaine. And, and we'll talk about it because they do literally start affecting the frontal cortex and the dopamine reward circuitry of the frontal cortex in exactly the same way. And we'll talk about some of the brain imaging research, but there's been recent brain imaging research that shows that the effects of screens on the frontal cortex, and the frontal cortex of the brain is, uh, we also call it the executive functioning part of the brain. The executive functioning part that controls our impulsivity is correlated to addiction disorders. If you have a compromised frontal cortex, you're, you're, you tend to be more impulsive and you tend to have also more uh, addictive types of issues. So we've seen that excessive screen exposure actually shrinks and there's been uh, about a half dozen brain imaging studies that show frontal cortex shrinkage uh, from excessive screen usage, which is exactly what we see with chronic cocaine usage, by the way. So Dr. Peter Weibar called it electronic cocaine, and then uh, a colleague and friend of mine, Commander Dr. Andrew Doan, who is the head of addiction research for the U.S. Navy, he coined the term digital pharmakia. And if you don't happen to speak Greek, pharmakia is the Greek word for um, technology turning against me. It's the Greek word for um, drugs. Particularly, why do we think that video games, and let's, we'll focus on social media as well, but why are video games, A, particularly so addictive and particularly have such clinical effects on young people? And that has to do with something, and I don't want to get too technical or too boring because it's a large group, but this has to do screens and the HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. And the HPA is essentially our fight or flight response. Um, and the fight or flight response is most of it. It's, it's obviously we know it's an evolutionary adaptation. We know that we're going to an adrenal fight or flight mode if some kind of uh, we're threatened in some kind of way. That if, uh, if we get, almost get hit by a car, we have this HPA elevation, and so we get this adrenal surge that happens. But from an evolutionary standpoint, the fight or flight response is meant to last about five minutes up to half an hour, maybe an hour at most, when people go into adrenal response. What happens with video games is children and young people go into an extended period of HPA arousal, and so they go into hour after hour after hour after hour of HPA activation. And so what does that look like? What does somebody that's been hyper-aroused or in fight or flight response for multiple hours or multiple days or multiple weeks begin to look like? So we know that people that have PTSD have a thing called hypervigilance, where they are uh, they're in this sort of hypervigilant state. And we know that what, it, what psychiatrists and psychologists call mood dysregulation. Um, so if somebody who is constantly been stimulated, imagine you've had 15 cups of Starbucks and you go and watch, think of the most uh, car chase movie you can think of, think about Liam Neeson's Taken, and you watch a real exciting movie, you drink a bunch of Star uh, Starbucks, and you're tweaking, right? Your adrenal system is aroused. Now somebody says to you, sit and read War and Peace, or sit and read a book. You can't downshift your adrenal system fast enough, but it takes a while for our adrenal systems to re-regulate themselves. And Dr. Victoria Dunkley is an adolescent psychiatrist in Los Angeles, and she's also a friend and a colleague, and she's written a book um, about resetting children's minds. She works a lot with tech addiction as well, and Victoria Dunkley talks about 
Victoria Dunkley talks about, it takes four to six weeks of a digital detox to restabilize a, a young child's metabolic and adrenal system. So she talks about, she's seen over a thousand uh, children over the last 10 years, and she will not prescribe or diagnose any of them until they go through a digital detox. So kids that come in with any kind of a mood disorder, attentional ADHD problem, even spectrum disorders, she says, hold on, let's not jump the gun, unplug for four to six weeks, let's bring the children back, and then let's see what the presenting symptoms are. And what she has found is that 60 to 65 percent of these children have a total dissip dissipation of their symptoms. Um, they're no longer mood dysregulated, you know, she calls it, uh, we call it that wired and tired, where kids get really that temper tantrum. In fact, there's a new diagnosis in the DSM. The DSM is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual that we use to diagnose people with mood dysregulation disorder for children. Why are kids having such temper tantrums these last few years? These darn kids seem to be really mood dysregulated. Why has ADHD gone up 20-fold, 20 times in the last 20 years? Now. There's been the argument that we're diagnosing or over-diagnosing ADHD, and maybe that accounts for some of that increase, that people have always been a little hyperactive. But there's a few of us, and there's many of us, that have looked at some of the research, and we think that there's a causal connection with some of the stimulants that some of our young people are being exposed to, because this HPA effect, uh, this hyper-arousing effect, leads to um, some of what we would call well, one of the most clinical effects is an intentional problem. The, well, one second. Um, attention. I want to move back for a second. Attention is a developmental window. Attention happens during key parts of a child's uh, developmental process. And we know that developmental windows are, and that children in general are very vulnerable developmentally during, during key parts of their childhoods. Uh, for example, we know that language is a key developmental window. And that if a child doesn't learn language between that important critical window, they become permanently compromised to attain language. So we've seen studies with kids who were feral children who weren't exposed to language um, until they were uh, late adolescents were never able to fully learn language. They were able to learn some words, but never idiomatic language or, or a complex sentence structure. So we know that the brain has certain uh, developmental opportunities for things like language. The same is true with attention. Uh, a child develops their sense of attention during a key age. And if that child is under or overstimulated during that key period when they're supposed to be learning how to attend and how to develop their sense of focus, their sense of uh, that ability becomes compromised as they get older. They become potential lifelong uh, candidates for ADHD types of effects. So the first person that researched screen effects in ADHD was Dr. Dimitri Christakis. And he was a researcher out of the University of Washington. And back in 1990, he looked at television screen effects in ADHD. Remember television? The thing is that rabbit ears on top and things that need a wrench to apply to change the TV station once in a while. So television increased ADHD. Uh, and, and when Dr. Christakis did a study in 1990, for every hour of television viewing uh, between the ages of two and six for children, their rates of ADHD went up 10%. So if a child between the ages of two and six watched three hours of television, he had a 30 or she had a 30% higher chance of ADHD for television. Now, fast forward 2010, and Dr. Christakis redid this research with interactive and immersive screens. And those are the two critical words when we talk about this generation, this generation of uh, technology. Uh, this generation of screens is different than television primarily because of two different criteria. They're interactive and they're immersive. Television was passive. So it did have an impact on children's development, but interactive and immersive screens are amplify that effect. 
So he found, Dr. Christakis found that the ADHD effect was amplified with interactive and immersive screens. Your chances for having attentional problems became even greater. So, and why is that? Why, why do screens and uh, video games... <laughs> Threats I've had too. Um, video games for a second. So, Dr. Doan is um, head of addiction research for the U.S. Navy and he works for the Pentagon. Dr. Doan is a Johns Hopkins MD and a Johns Hopkins PhD. And he was asked by the military to study video game addiction. <laughs> about four or five years ago. And there was an incident uh, in Washington, D.C. that was called the Navy Yard shooting. And the Navy Yard shooting occurred, um, there, was, there was a 19-year-old Buddhist from Queens who was in the Navy who had been playing uh, Call of Duty for 12 to 14 hours a day and had been shooting for 25. I hate to turn it off altogether. Let's get the two of them apart from each other. Okay. Is that better? Okay. So Dr. Doan was asked to look into video game addiction by the U.S. Uh, Navy because uh, this Navy Yard shooting episode that had happened uh, raised some attention because they know that the Navy Yard shooter had gone violent and he had been, by all accounts, a peaceful Buddhist uh, before his gaming addiction. And the other thing that happens with people who get hooked on video games is the, the sleep deprivation. And the sleep deprivation, uh, it's, it's a stimulant. So if you stay, uh, gamers that I've worked with have stayed up days sometimes playing their video games. In fact, if you Google World of Warcraft and diapers, you'll see that there's support groups of teenagers who actually wear diapers, adult diapers, while they play World of Warcraft so they don't take a break, they don't go to the bathroom, they don't go to sleep so they can stay playing for multiple days while they do quote-unquote raids, um, or, or they pee in urine jars so they don't take a break from the game. The hypnotic pull of the game is that intense. And again, I'm not making that up. You could uh, not work with gamers who have done that. So uh, gaming has a very powerful gravitational pull on some of the young people that do that. The problem is if you stay awake for two or three days, bad things can happen and people start getting delusional, psychotic-like symptoms, and so the Navy Yard shooter started having paranoid-like symptoms, and he unfortunately went and shot 12, killed 12 people. And so Dr. Doan was asked to investigate video game addiction, and what he found was that it was, in every way, a digital drug, and that it raised dopamine levels in exactly the same way that substances do as well. And so, Uh, let me just go to this. Video games raise dopamine. Uh, the word is called dopaminergic, and how dopaminergic uh, something is correlates to how dopamine activating or how much it raises our dopamine. And so what we know is that dopamine is the feel-good neurotransmitter that's in our brains. And when something's pleasurable, dopamine gets raised. And there was a study that was done in 1998 with Dr. Cope that looked at different things that raise their dopamine levels. And so craving foods like chocolate raised their dopamine 50%. Sex and video games were as dopaminergic as each other. So uh, a video game was as arousing as uh, a sexual experience, and cocaine was 350% dopaminergic, and crystal meth was at the top of 1,200% dopaminergic. So that's why we consider something like crystal meth to be the most addicting substance but people can get addicted to any one of these types of experiences if they're vulnerable, especially if they're vulnerable towards having an addictive personality or, or being, uh, there's different ideological theories about addiction, why some people are more genetically inclined to be addicted, but if you have an addictive vulnerability and you experience something that makes your brain go ding, 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 you're gonna have a potential problem with that device or that substance. And now we're talking about potentially a device that is as, let's call it, a, well, I mean, there are children in the room, but number two, if it's as activating as number two, um, 
we as adults have fully developed frontal cortexes, which are also our impulse control. Uh, a child doesn't have a fully developed frontal cortex. So if you give some, a child something as arousing or as activating as, let's say, a sexual experience, they don't have the neurological apparatus to just say no. They just don't have the hardware yet. We don't develop our, full, our frontal cortex until we're in our early 20s. So a seven or eight year old is not equipped to be able to say, I'll do it for half an hour. Uh, at least most aren't. Uh, and, and rare is the child that is able to say, I can, I'll do something that's stimulating and stop after half an hour. Um, there was some really fascinating research also out of the military that really sh began to show the drug-like effects of screens. And I found this particularly eye-opening. I was really amazed when I read about this. And again, Dr. Doan turned me on to this research. So at the University of Washington, two psychologists had found that, well, let me back up, um, combat war veterans that were coming back from Iraq who were burn victims, who had been blown up by IEDs, had to go through burn treatment. And, and if any of you know what it's like to go through burn treatment, the most painful part of being a burn patient is the daily wound care. They have to take off your bandages, scrub down the wound, and it's excruciatingly painful. So most burn victims get put on high doses daily of morphine, and they have to just to be able to tolerate the pain. The two psychologists at the University of Washington uh, came, found that if burn victims were playing a video game, and it was a virtual reality video game called Snow World, they felt no pain. And in fact, the military did an MRI study of those burn victims, and they found that their brains were experiencing less pain that the actual digital morphine was more powerful than the actual morphine. Um, and I'll just show you a picture of what that looked like in a moment. So there's a military burn victim, and that's him playing Snow World while they're treating his burns. Now, again, this is a wonderful use of technology for pain management, but we're giving the same digital morphine to seven-year-olds. The game that activates his endorphins so much that he doesn't feel pain is a fairly innocuous video game, but that's what it looks like, by the way. That's Snow World. With a little, it has a little Paul Simon music in the background. It's a happy little ditty game. But it's very, you, know, you throw snow balls at these, at these little penguins. But when we looked at their, the MRIs of their brains, we saw that they were being affected more powerfully than morphine. And what does that look like longitudinally on the child's brain? If, to me, this, this, is, a, this is something uh, that we have, and we have no idea what that's going to do to a child's brain longitudinally over 10 to 20 years. We have no idea what digital morphine will actually do to someone, or electronic cocaine, or call it whatever you want to call it. Uh, there was another fascinating study at the Indiana University School of Medicine here, what was really great about the study is they took kids or young people who were not gamers. So they did post, pre and post brain imaging. So these kids uh, or adolescents, they weren't video gamers, and then they wanted to see what happens to the brain after 10 hours a week of video games. Just 10 hours a week, which by the way, some kids are playing every day. But so 10 hours a week, which is fairly moderate usage by most standards today. Most kids might play two hours a day, that would come out to 10 hours a week. So, so Dr. Wang's conclusion was for the first time we found that a sample of randomly assigned young adults showed less activation in certain frontal brain regions following a week, a week of playing violent video games. The effect of brain regions are important for controlling emotion and aggressive behavior. The frontal brain regions are also the same brain regions that are affected by drug addiction. For the first time, researchers showed a direct relationship between playing violent video games and a subsequent change in those brain regions associated with executive functioning. Um, and I was going to show you those brain scans. That was the uh, control group was the top line, and the two-week video game group was on the bottom. 
the red activation is a good thing. The less activated part on the bottom row is a bad thing. That means the brain was getting uh, less activation. The brain was actually getting uh, less uh, activated by those. And these were key parts of the frontal cortex. The good news was that after a couple of weeks of not playing video games due to neuroplasticity, the brains went back to normal. Um, but that was after a couple of weeks. We don't know what happens to brains that are playing video games hour after hour, week after week, month after month, year after year. Um, so there were some more studies that showed some of these brain imaging effects. I won't bore you with some of the details. Needless to say that there were quite a few studies that were in peer-reviewed journals that showed gray matter and white matter abnormalities in brains of young people that were involved in excessive screen exposure. Um, beyond addiction tech effects, I mentioned uh, Victoria Dunkley before. She was the adolescent psychiatrist that developed this digital detox protocol. Uh, but what she said is it's not just the extreme end of the spectrum, because we know that, yes, we do know that kids who play too much can develop problems. But she said that many of the children I see suffer from sensory overload, lack of restorative sleep, and a hyper aroused nervous system, regardless of the diagnosis, what I call electronic screen syndrome. These children are impulsive, moody, and can't pay attention. And she talked about those are kids that with moderate screen exposure. She has found that she's had children that when they went off of screens, no longer needed medication for some of her ADHD kids. She found some kids with learning disabilities that when they were retested, were, went up one or two grade levels. She's found kids that no longer needed other kinds of medications when they went off of screens. Uh, they were sleeping better. They were less uh, mood dysregulated. Uh, they were less aggressive. Um, and so there were some pretty profound effects. And I talked earlier about some of the ADHD effects, so I won't go into those again. Um, video games and aggression um, is another thing that we've seen a lot of. And primarily it was the people at the University of Washington who did about 15 years of research on the effects of violent video game imagery and aggression. And primarily what that looked like was it doesn't necessarily look like uh, a teenager becoming a homicidal maniac, but it could be that that young person becomes more aggressive. If, uh, if somebody's playing Call of Duty for a few hours a day, it gets them more amped up, so that might look more like kicking their sister later that night, or that might look like getting into a fight at school, and that's what one of their studies that they did. They looked at video gamers and behavioral episodes in school over the course of an academic year, and the kids that were violent video gamers had more behavioral episodes in school during the course of that, their academic year. Um, so uh, in the year 2000, the, there was uh, what was called the Congressional Public Health Summit. And the Congressional Public Health Summit was the heads of the AMA, the APA, the American Pediatric Association, and basically the five heads of the top <coughs> medical bodies that are vested in protecting us as a society. And they came away with certain powerful conclusions well over a thousand studies include reports from the Surgeon General's Office, the National Institute of Mental Health, and you know, I won't go through it, but the conclusion, the conclusion of the public health community based on over 30 years of research is that viewing entertainment violence can lead to an increase in aggressive attitudes, values, behavior, particularly in children. And again, these effects were quantifiable, they were measurable, and they actually said that they were causal as well. In, in research, we talk about correlation and causation, and the studies were finding that the aggression effects were causal, not correlational to excessive uh, violent video game imagery. I won't go into, um, there have been a couple of specific, uh, there's incidents of adolescents who did some pretty bad things to their parents uh, when they had their games taken away. So we have children in the room, so I will skip by some of those, um, but I will say that in this one particular case in Newtown, um, we know that Adam Lanza had admittedly other underlying psychiatric issues. Uh, he had OCD, he was on the spectrum, he was pulled out of school, he was isolated, he had a lot of other issues, but we do also know that his whole world revolved around violent video games. That's all he did day and night. And the conclusion by uh, the investigators, and this was a report by the Connecticut, the Connecticut State Attorney General's Office, looked at his 
gaming profile, and that essentially this young man was, I think, uh, a perfect example of video game psychosis. He was in the Matrix, uh, and he had committed, uh, he had 88,000 kills and 22,000 headshots, and he was playing these realistic first-person shooter games called Modern Warfare 2, and he was actually also playing a game called School Shooter. Uh, and in the game School Shooter, the, the player goes from classroom to classroom taking out students. And some people might say, how is such a game uh, allowable? Uh, there's also a game called Columbine, by the way, uh, as well. So, a perfect storm, perhaps. Mental illness with exposure of such kind of imagery had some pretty horrible outcomes, plus there's exposure of uh, firearms, and I think it was a pretty horrific, perfect storm. But let's go on to happier subjects, social media. Uh, so social media, we are the most connected society that's ever existed on the planet. Um, over 1.23 billion of us are on Facebook, and we have, uh, I, I go into it in my book, how many tweets and emails and texts we sent a second, it's in the trillions, and so we are socially connected. And as social animals, we should be pretty, uh, the, the more socially connected we are, you would think that our mental health would be increasing. And yet, our depression rates are going higher and higher, and yet we're seeing more and more mental health effects as our social media usage increases. There's also uh, research that's been done on what's called Facebook depression. And there was one particular study that showed that the more friends you had on Facebook, the more depressed you were. Uh, which is kind of an ironic twist. Um, and so what do we get from that? Well, the one was the, the comparison effect. And the comparison effect is, let's face it, when somebody posts on Facebook, they're posting their best vacation selves. They're posting their idealized selves. And let's say you're having a bad day, and you're a little down, and you start drifting on Facebook, and all you see is everyone's best self. It amplifies your own uh, maybe my life is what I wanted it to be, and so that's the comparison effect that some people talk about with Facebook discussion. Um, the other part of it is that it's this idea that it's this idea that social media isn't an authentic uh, social connection. That as social animals, we need face-to-face -face interpersonal connection. And Robin Dunbar was an anthropologist. And there was a number called the Dunbar number. He had studied primate uh, groupings, and he studied people. And Robin Dunbar found that uh, as social uh, primates and human beings, we could only handle about 150 acquaintances. That's all our brain can handle, about 150 acquaintances. But about five, we need about three to five friends. That's the Dunbar number. That if I don't have, those are the people that when the, uh, the S hits the fan at 3 o'clock in the morning, you need a friend to talk to. Those typically aren't your Facebook friends. And, but what happens is that people that have developed this, this facade of social connection through social media, that seems to lessen their actual interpersonal real life connections. And so I've got 500 Facebook friends, but I don't have a real friend I can talk to. And so that seems to also account for some of these depression and, and mental health effects. We call it the illusion of the social media uh, connection. Finally, we, we'll talk about some of the psychiatric issues that happen again, too, with um, psychotic-like features. And Dr. Mark Griffiths and Angelica de Gortari, who were two psychologists in England that, again, going back to video gaming, looked at the reality-blurring aspects of some games. And they found, they did a study with over 1,600 video gamers, that the video games were, were so real and so immersive and so interactive that most of the, the 1,600 people in their study had episodes of what they termed game transfer phenomenon. That was episodes where a kid who was a gamer would hear or see the game days or weeks after they had played. So they would hear sword swoops or gunfire or see images of the game or Minecraft, or there's a lot of examples of kids who are playing Minecraft, would start seeing the world in cubes. Um, and this effect goes back years. This, uh, back in uh, the late 1990s in the Harvard, they studied what was called the Tetris effect. Anybody remember Tetris? Innocent little squares, the tetraminos they used to call them. And people that were playing, playing Tetris too much would begin to see the, the squares in the periphery of their vision and would see them when they woke up or when they dreamed at night. 
And so we know that visual imagery that comes on an immersive screen has a really searing effect on our psyche. That I, I might imagine something if I read it in a book. If I'm reading Harry Potter, or if I'm reading a particularly imaginative book, it might arouse my imagination. And I might, you know, wake up saying, oh, mommy, daddy, or as adults, we might see some of that imagery in our mind's eye if we read something. But what we see is that in this kind of 3D, 52-inch immersive imagery, it has a more imprinting effect on our, 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 our psyche. And so that can have a much more powerful uh, negative effect as well. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about uh, screens and schools. I did write a, an op-ed for a, a Time magazine a couple weeks ago about screens and schools. Um, we've been told the narrative that screens are educational. We've been told that from administrators and, and schools, and yet the research just isn't there. The research just doesn't show that a, a kindergartner with a tablet has any better uh, outcomes in school than uh, a kid that doesn't have a screen. And what we see is that, in, in effect, we've allowed this Trojan horse into the classroom. This Trojan horse that is potentially filled with clinical disorders under the pretense of it's educational. And so, there. Uh, I won't go into the detail of it, but uh, LA, in the LA school system, they had bought a contract with Apple and Microsoft uh, Pearson, 1.3 billion dollars two years ago. Uh, after three weeks, the FBI investigated that contract. It had been not properly bid out. There was allegations of kickbacks and profiteering. Uh, within two weeks, the software was hacked. The iPads were. Kids were watching porn and playing video games on it. The, the district shelved it. All 650,000 kids who had gotten those tablets in Los Angeles, uh, they all essentially went to waste. Um, the research, and I can go, there's, there's been over 50 studies that look at actual, the efficacy of screens versus non-screens in schools, and most of them show that screens don't have any educational benefit. And so there are countries like Finland who have rejected screens outright, uh, the top educator in Australia, uh, uh, the, he's a Cambridge scholar, he has also said, he, his quote, and I'm paraphrasing him, is when we look back upon this period in education, we're going to realize that this has been one of the greatest hoaxes ever committed. Um, there's a financial agenda. Education technology is a $60 billion a year industry. Um, they make a lot of money selling schools technology. And, and, and quite honestly, as parents, I think we need to be a little bit more aware and advocate that why are our schools spending limited tax dollars on technology when they're laying off teachers? Uh, again, the, the, the best school system in the world by most ma uh, metrics is Finland. And Finland very clearly has rejected screens. Their, uh, their uh, education minister has said, we're not investing in screens. They do have smart boards in some of their classes. But they understand that what the investment in education has to be in teachers and students in the Socratic circle and the teaching and the shaping of the young minds. And what we're seeing is that the most low-tech parents are high-tech people. Um, what we're seeing is that Steve Jobs, the iPad guru, didn't allow his kids to have iPads. That was in the New York uh, Times interview in 2010. And we also see that some of the top designers in, in Silicon Valley, both in Yahoo and Google, put their kids in non-tech Waldorf schools. What does that tell us? The people that are inventing tech for our children don't put their kids in tech schools. Um, so that's just something to consider. And finally, phones in the classroom. This is more for the high school level. This was an on point. This study is fairly recent. It was a year ago. The London School of Economics in England, they started going in the other direction and did than we have in the United States. They've started banning phones in the classrooms in, at the high school level. Here, we've sort of raised the white flag and we've allowed screen, uh, kids to have phones in schools in high school. They did a 10-year study with 130, uh, 130,000 students, and they found that when you took away phones from the classrooms, the test scores went up 6% across the board, and specifically kids who had special needs and who were from more compromised so, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, their test scores went up 14%. The screen is a distraction, folks. If, if your child is in high school and they have a phone in their pocket, 
and that gadget's got games and music and texting and I am and all sorts of things it can explore and you've got Charlie Brown's teacher wah 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 at the front of the class. I've done observations in hundreds of classrooms in my work in school districts. It's it's there are I and I've talked to dozens of teachers in writing my book. Uh, you have one percentage of teachers that will say and they tend to be the younger teachers will fight the good fight, but I spend a third of my period saying, put your phone away, put your phone away, put your phone away, put your phone away. And then you'll have the older teachers typically who will say, we don't even bother. If you want to have your phone out, play video games or whatever, sit in the back and let me focus on the 10 kids in the front who are focusing. So it's a problem. And, and you know, when I've spoken to administrators and I've done this presentation on OCs for school administrators, I have some administrators who are very sympathetic and they will say, yeah, we don't want phones in the classroom or screens in the classroom, but they'll say, but the parents, we can't fight the parents. The parents will say, my, my child needs to have their telephone in school. No, no, no. And we say, why? What did you do 10 years ago? I was going to say 15 years ago, 10 years ago. There is a thing called the landline. Um, so this idea of parents being able to stay totally plugged into their kids is we understand that. Uh, again, I'm a parent, but if we understand that that device is, is potentially um, problematic, maybe it's not the ideal thing. Maybe it's not so ideal. So, what we do finally, what I'll wind it up before, because I would love to hear from you all from any questions or feedback that everybody else has. What we're seeing that does seem to be the solution um, that does seem to be the solution is kids having real world natural experiences, uh, face to face experiences. Uh, I've worked a lot with kids who have had real, honest to goodness tech addiction, whose lives were getting really hurt by their uh, overuse of screen time. And, and the antidote, uh, some of those kids needed to go to wilderness programs where they totally unplugged for four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, and immerse themselves in real life experiences. Some of those kids were able to taper back and cut back their screen usage to more moderate usage. But we know that, and here's a phrase that I love, that I think is accurate, our technology has outraced our evolution. Um, we are still in hunter and gatherer bodies. We still process things in a very, it takes 50 generations for our DNA to change. And in 10 to 15 years we have changed, we've had a seismic shift in the way that our younger generation is experiencing the world. Um, my suggestion is that we be a little bit more cautious and thoughtful up to the age that we roll out some of these screen experiences to children because they, we don't know which children are the vulnerable ones. Sometimes a child can appear totally healthy and their immersion into screen experiences can be overwhelming. And other kids have to have no problem with it. But it's a little bit of Russian roulette. And so so awareness and caution is is is, is my big takeaway from this talk today. Uh, being aware of what the potential downsides are. And so with that, if, uh, I'll, I'll wind it down if anybody has any uh, questions or specific comments on the floor of yours and we'll search it that way. No. Why don't you repeat the questions, Nick, or, unless they want to use a microphone, that's good. Yeah, I'm going to try to get my uh, balance mic going. I have a daughter in the East Hampton School District and I'm wondering if you've gone and spoken like, to the high school there um, or the elementary school. In the You're asking I'm asking you, yes, if you've gone and spoken to yeah, that there. Fine, I've, I've spoken to the, yeah, I've, I've spoken to the superintendent, and I've spoken to, by the way, to all the local school districts, and some, I will say, have been more uh, evolved in understanding the problem than others. Some want to do workshops, some want to do more awareness. I, I think the goal, at least that I was trying to do, is to put the brakes on the elementary levels and then to have more thoughtful phone policies at the high school level. And, um, and so I, there was a good conversation that happened. Uh, I don't know how that's translated yet with uh, different people find. They seem to be very receptive to the problem. They seem to be genuinely concerned about their children. We know that 
social media has amplified a lot of traditional problems in high school settings. Social media has amplified things like bullying. So now we have cyberbullying. We have things that are viral. We have sexting. We have, we have, you know, those of us that are of a certain age, multiply that by a hundred through the social media effect. So if you were called a name, I'm 52. If you were called a certain name 20 or 30 years ago, it was pretty traumatizing. Now imagine it goes viral and it's on eight school districts. So we've seen kids hurting themselves and, and sometimes hurting themselves in a permanent way. And so um, schools are trying, you know, they're, they're assigning assistant principals to monitor social media pages. A few years ago, that was considered illegal. A few years ago, school districts used to say, social media is not our, not our job. You know, they used to say, it's, you know, that's the parents' domain, but now they're, they are assigning APs to monitor social media. So if anybody threatens somebody on social media, it does fall into the, the umbrella of the school's responsibility. So I, I think the more vocal parents we have that say, what is your policy on screen? I don't want my fourth grader having a tablet. Um, in my book, I have an opt-out letter that says, uh, for elementary school kids, I, I, here's a link to the research. I want my child ta taught in the traditional manner and don't give them a tablet. I mean, we had to do that to my kid's school and request that they not be given tablets uh, at, in the third grade. Uh. Hi, thank you for being here today and um, talking to us about this. Uh, I have two children. Um, I'm also an addiction specialist. I haven't um, worked in over 15 years in the field. And my kids don't think that I have any validity in what I say. Um, my question is, I read the article about um, the doctor who would not prescribe uh, a treatment plan or medication because she did the four to six weeks of detox. What could you recommend to us today as uh, a detox program at home to help our kids wean off? Because, you know, I see a lot of heads down, and, and even in adults, but what could we do at home? Is there any advice you could give us tonight to help our own kids maybe come up with um, a plan at home the last time I did this talk, I was asked, what's what's the right amount of time? <laughs> it's just like an hour screen time, half an hour, two hours, what's that perfect formula? And I kind of analogize it a little bit to the recommendations of drinking while pregnant. It's a continuum. And so, you know, they used to recommend one drink a week, one drink a day, no alcohol while pregnant. We don't know which drink it is in that continuum that causes fetal alcohol. <laughs> Uh, we don't know a child to child. Is it the second hour that creates a, a screen effect? Is it the first half hour? Um, so if you, you know your children better than anyone, if you've seen that you're, and what are some of the clinical criteria of addiction, they're no longer, uh, it's negatively impacting their lives, they're no longer as engaged in the activities that they used to like to do. So if your child used to love to play soccer and they quit soccer, if they're no longer making eye contact with you, if they get aggressive when the game is taken away, or when their screen time gets modified, if you begin to see those ouch points, you know, that's when we, we could say, all right, now we're seeing, maybe they have crossed that line of problems. So I advocate a taper rather than a, a cold turkey detox, and you know, because we learned that in the addiction world, if you cold turkey someone, you're gonna have some pushback. If you taper somebody down, so if you think your child has been on screens, uh, are on screens for too many hours a day, and you could begin to wean them down by half an hour a week, or an hour a week per day, and you replace that with something constructive, or you make them earn their screen time. So we used to talk about, all right, they're on, they're on your screens for two hours a day, by the end of the week, you're gonna have them down to an hour and a half, and the next an hour, eventually, but the key is you can't just unplug your kids and say, sit in an empty room and twiddle your thumbs. Uh, the idea is that then you have to re-engage your children in real life activities. You have to re-spark their interest because what we find with kids, what I found with the thousand kids that I've worked with, plugging kids are apathetic and easily bored. They've been hyper stimulated, you know. So now all of a sudden the kid who's a kid who's fought fantasy worlds and, and slayed dragons, now you're gonna say, go kick a soccer ball. It's boring. So we have to come and get back to that and then process and it's not easy. The one thing Dr. Lumpy talks about and I talk about, you're gonna get some pushback. It's, it's, you know, in uh, the Asian modification, we call it the uh, behavior extinction, the, the, the uh, extinction burst. 
So you're going to get a little flailing and screaming for a day or two. And it'll calm down. But, but yeah, if you think your child has a problem, definitely make it a point to either cut down the usage or a little bit. Hi, my name is Sylvia. I have two kids, one's 12, one's 9. And I've read a lot. I've been, it's great to learn the problems, what happens. But in terms of solutions, we real, like, you know, take it away in a couple days, I'll calm down. And, you know, I don't think that's going to happen with my son. I'm concerned. Um, have there been any studies regarding content? In forms of, like, hey, uh, would he be better off playing FIFA than if he was called the movie all these horrible comments so far? It does matter, right? So some games are, you know, if you've looked at it, like they're <laughs> drugs, you know, crack is worse than cocaine, so far, the other games are worse than a nature game. But the radiant screen itself is hypnotic. Um, but you're right, but there are some content where you could say, if you want to get a substitution for the stuff less problematic content. That I've been focused on youth therapy saying this. Um, I find it easier treating heroin addiction than digital addiction. We have standard protocols to treat drug addiction, and you know that abstinence works. Nick, do you mind speaking? Because this is really important, and we can't hear it back here. What I've you're been saying. quoted in, uh, saying that I find it easier to treat heroin addiction than digital addiction for a couple of reasons. We have established treatment protocols for drug addiction. We know how to detox someone, how to get them abstinent. But in our virtual society, technology is ubiquitous. So to, it's really challenging. I've, had, I've worked with a young man, i worked with a young man who was sent away for two years to therapeutic school. Two years, he had no screen exposure, nothing. He was enrolled in this program in therapeutic school in Virginia. And he came, he lived on the West Coast. He moved back home, his mother gave him a smartphone after one week, and he was right back in the hole. Yet I've worked with other kids, who they did a digital detox, they, they unplugged for a few weeks, and then they were able to moderate their use as you go back. We call it digital vegetables versus digital candy. Uh, digital vegetables are healthy uses of technology, using the internet to research a paper versus playing for digital candy. It's just something that's just uh, you know, a video game. That serves no purpose other than sedation and, and hypnotizing a young person. Um, but this is really challenging, and like I said, I, I work with this professionally. It is really hard if your child has crossed that tipping point to go back to moderate usage, and we've seen that really the only thing that does seem to work is a digital detox, not for a couple of days, but four to six weeks, and then that resets, and then, then see how much more they can tolerate once they've, once they've detoxed a period of time. Yeah, the last chapter of the solution chapter that talks about but again, when we talk about substituting other, you know, you guys have lasagna in the back. There used to be a public service announcement that Jigger Lee Curtis did years ago for drug addiction. And Jigger Lee Curtis used to say the best anti-drug is lasagna. And it was having dinner with your family without, and, and I would add, without screens. You know, having non-screen time together is part of the solution face-to-face. Uh, -face because again, if your child is falling down the rabbit hole, depending on how far down the rabbit hole, it can be challenging. Um, if you're beginning to see the problem, then it's easier. And I would say prevention is easier than cure at this point. So if your children are little, be mindful that they don't fall down the rabbit hole. But as they get older, and it's trying to get them reconnected with things that they used to like to do. Um, my question was in a similar vein. Um, most of the studies are about highly stimulating video experiences. So how would you look at situations so my kid plays chess on the iPad or he reads on the iPad? What's the difference between that experience versus playing chess real life or reading a book uh, in paper format? Yeah. Um, no, I would say you know, obviously less, less problematic than my Call of Duty, right? But I'll talk about reading specifically. So Ann Mangan, Ann Mangan was, a, was a researcher out of Norway that looked at reading. Of a paper versus the radiant screen, and Ann Mangan found that the retention rates were 20% higher if you read some same content, if you read the same content on paper versus a radiant screen. There's something about the blue light that negatively impacts our brains. We don't, uh, blue light not only stimulates our brains way back, you know, those of you that are aware of 
sleep hygiene. Uh, you know, those of you that have insomnia, you've probably been told, don't have your phone, don't look at any screens for at least two to three hours before you go to bed because that light keeps you awake and it dysregulates your circadian rhythms and everything else. But from a reading perspective, your brain doesn't absorb the content of the screen as much for some reason. And, and Manning also talked about the topography of the page, that a paper page is a landscape, and you orient yourself as you read on that page, where if you're scrolling on the Kindle, it's a little more disorienting. And so there's a, less of a reference point uh, sometimes. So, there's, so there's those effects as well. It's not as problematic, but yeah, I want to go way in the back and see if your hands up. Yeah, I can talk. Yeah, okay. Do you go ahead. Um, make any distinctions? You did a little bit with Facebook. But can you talk a little bit about you know being absorbed by social media like um, Instagram and photo photo kinds of things that you know in and of themselves are not problematic, but all those experiences, of an IM, a text, an Instagram, is also dopaminergic. And there's, so our brain lights up, and now there's another concept that I talk about in my book called neophilia. Neophilia is the desire to experience something new, which we're genetically hardwired for. It was an evolutionary adaptation. Uh, we were explorers when we were hunter-gatherers because we had to discover fire and new settlements. So we're wired in our DNA to explore the new. So every tweet, Instagram, text, beep, bop, sound that comes up is a new experience. And so we're genetically wired to want to open up that, that Instagram. And so it's an intersection of dopamine activating and it's something new. I've got to find out what it is. And so that has a very compelling and compulsing effect, especially on young people. Because here's the difference. I want to rehash this point. How many of us as adults have a problem with technology, with the addicting effects of technology? I'm guilty. Um, and we have this fully developed frontal cortex. So our teenagers don't even have that. That's why they go bungee jumping and take risk-making behaviors, because they don't consequentially think as we do. So if we have a problem with that, the 8, 10, and 14-year-olds are going to have even more of a problem with that. And that's what we're talking about. We want to at least unroll the technology when their brain's a little bit more fully developed to have the ability to put on the brakes if they need to. shows are very popular, like music videos. It's that pacing. Now, Mr. Rogers has that slower pacing. That's with, uh, even, even the older Sesame Street. Somebody at my last talk said modern Sesame Street is different than the old Sesame Street in terms of the pacing. It's the frenetic pacing and the rapid cuts that create the, and that's what Dr. Christak has talked about, about that ADHD effect. But let's be clear, digital imagery the, the phrase, there was an educational researcher called Dr. Monkey. He talked about they compress time and space. So kids get very used to things happening quickly on the screening screen. Even the nature show, Dr. Monkey talked about kids were watching a fishing channel, right? So they were watching a fishing show, which you would think is 
relatively slow on the, on the, on the TV show, but in the 30-minute uh, fishing show, you know, they caught the mackerel, caught it, reeled it in, and then they took the kids real life fishing. The kids were like, uh, we've been here two hours, we haven't caught a fish yet on the TV show, they caught the fish in eight minutes. <laughs> so the screen experience creates this impatient effect, right? It accelerates life, and it happens to adults, but it really happens more to kids. So my personal recommendation is a little bit of television for kids, monitor isn't that problematic, as long as you make sure it's not that frenetic pacing, but the interactive screens, tablets, phones, not till 10. Not till 10. I mean, you know, you know, that's my rec that's a, a lover's recommendation. Yeah. Is there much distinction between watching the YouTube videos and playing the games and TV? You mean just watching YouTube videos up, up oh, game game? Game. Yeah, you know, because that's what the kids are doing now. Yeah, yeah the kids are watching. watching you know, they're watching all these uh, PewDiePie, right? They're watching I have or something. So right now, right, those of you, you know that there's professional gamers now, right? For the rest of you know that there's e-athletes and they're watching and then they'll watch, you know, and, and uh, Staples Arena, major auditoriums are being sold out to people watching video gamers. And in the last year, there's been the first million dollar gamer. You know, 10 years ago, a child used to say, I want to be a professional video gamer. And every teacher and parent used to say, yeah, I want to be a professional video gamer. But now there's really a Michael Jordan of video games. Uh, it was a Lithuanian young man who was made for the first million dollar game. If I had young people who were saying, I want to be like Mike, I want to be like him. And they'll watch hours and hours of YouTube of people playing their League of Legends commentary. That's the commentary that they're playing. Yeah. Again, it's, it's, it's like, it's on my, uh, we can be in, um, I can't remember the there's a joke saying, you know your life is in a bad place because I was watching a fishing show, not even fishing. You know, um, if you're watching gamers game, you're not even gaming. I mean, uh, again, that's, I don't think that's an ideal childhood. You know, secondhand video gaming. I mean, even saying it, it's, it's, it's again, I, again, I know it's very popular with kids, and I work with this, is what they're doing. I know it's the commentary, they get that sort of like the look to it, but it's, it's another sedentary, What's the correlation between um, verbal development and video games for a young child? Like, yeah, so they, they did a study just, just, just this year, hot off the press in 2016, that the microstructural properties of the brain that are developed for verbal development were damaged by excessive screen exposure. So the, the verbal intelligence part of the brain was was the, the gray matter and the myelination. The myelination part of the verbal development part were, were the word that they used was compromised. Now some researchers will tell you that they've shown that if you play some word recognition like games, the only benefit that they've shown with uh, some screen experience like video games has been hand-eye coordination, reflex time, and there's been some research about word acquisition. Um, and yet there was a other study that showed that the verbal intelligence part of the brain gets compromised. So I would say that those are don't outweigh the potential downsides. So uh, my child will have better, you know, rapid eye you know, reflex time to you know to be a fighter pilot or to play a fighter pilot video game, but he might get ADHD, depression, anxiety, you know, psychosis, and it doesn't do any way out. Uh, anybody else want to? Um, I'm just curious because I'm, I'm, I'm here and I'm going to process this, but then I'm going to try to relay it to my son. Me. Um, how, how are you doing, or, or, or people like you doing, in working with the educational system, the administrators? Because if you could have a room full of my son's peers, they might listen together in a way that would be different to a nanny and mother. Um, and I'm curious to know how, 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 how are the educators reacting to people like you? Because I feel like great question. Um, you're right. I, I'm trying to reach the parents now because the educators, I, even the sympathetic educators, 
say, well, West Hampton's got and habits, and their schools are keeping up with the Joneses mentality. And I, I had a superintendent look me in the face and say, well, you know, we have to keep up with them because it's educational. And I say, prove it. Show me that it's educational. Show me one study that says that tablet in that school is educational. Humana, humana, humana. And, and they don't have, but they've been conned, but they will, but they do respond to a collective voice of parents. So that's really sort of my, and I, what we're trying to do is uh, we're also trying to get a petition to have uh, warning labels put on screens, uh, similar to the cigarette movement, that excessive screen exposure can lead to clinical disorders, just a little warning label, just enough to give parent pause to say that, um, and so really we're the ones that are, that have, if the parents had a grassroots movement to say, have we really vetted this stuff yet? You know, are we really sure this is good for my child yet? Because none of us parents want anything that we think is harmful to our kids. But, the, but what a lot of us have gotten sort of sucked into is, well, if the school gave my kid uh, a device, how bad can it be? And yet they have the measure. They've sort of kept up with their peers. It's been the emperor's new clothes. Nobody wants to say none of this works. Superintendent of the SAC Harvard School, Katie Graves. Um, she talks about her son was autistic, and she brought him to uh, one of one of his special ed teachers. Said to put him in front of the screen. The screen was going to be really great for his autism. And luckily, this is 15 years ago. The psychiatrist said, "Get him as far away from that screen as possible, because what he needed was early intervention socialization, and the screen does the opposite." So, so okay, yeah, you know what? You're, you're talking about as you know, if you're, if you're autistic. There are a, a whole spectrum of therapies, you know, OT, SLP, and education. So not just one foundation. Right. You've got four or $500 apps on these tablets, or AAC apps, that are transforming these children's lives. But for nonverbal, so what I was going to say is for nonverbal autism, I think it's, it's an essential communication device. But for, uh, for spectrum kids who need social skills, it's, it, it does more, I, I hate to say it, but it, it's not a good thing, and, and I'm not alone in that. And, you know, we could agree to disagree, but how, how is that kids, you're saying that app is transforming, these are verbal not, Asperger's children? No, no, non-verbal, non-verbal. And, 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 and it's... Well, we also work with, we also work with Down syndrome children out in California that are working on tablets and helping communication skills and visual skills. Right. I think there's a really big difference between apps and video games. I had no video games when I raised my children. Right. Race free. Never Nintendo, PlayStation, whatever the other names are, none. And we had limited TV in my house. One TV, and it was limited to videos on weekends. But I do see where there's a place for apps for education, and I do feel like the genie is out of the bottle. So rather than try to stuff it back in there, we need to deal with it. I think parents need to take charge and manage what your children are doing. Content, content, content is king. Right, but, and with all due respect, we're talking about special needs kids, I just, again, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go into Steve Jobs' camp and say, I just don't think if my child doesn't have any uh, other issues, I don't think a screen is, or an app, I think it has a hypnotic effect that's not uh, appropriate developmentally for their brains. And I think that there could be some benefit for nonverbal children. And but you know, the research does show. I really think moderation is the key to life. Oh. And I, I agree with well, you. Well, moderate, moder moderating moderate heroin, heroin is not effective. Insane. Moderation with heroin is not effective. Well, we said the same thing about TVs. Oh, TV, TV. No, no, and right. TV. And, and it's said about radio. And that's right. And the whole point of my talk was that this generation of media is qualitatively different than television because of the immersive interactive effect, which some people would argue that makes it better. But the moderation line that I get a lot, again, moderating alcohol if you're pregnant isn't great, moderating drugs if you're 
Um, but not everything in moderation is, is, is ideal. Developmentally, look, driving a car is great, but I'm not going to give my car keys to my nine-year-old either. Um, and I just don't think they're developmentally ready for it yet. Now, I'm not disagreeing that apps can be good for some non-verbal and some disorders. Parents come home, they're too busy with the children, they put on the storybook app, an educational app, they engage them. I mean, we know that. That's the problem. <laughs> on that note, but I appreciate, I appreciate your feedback on it. Well, I guess we'll agree to disagree on that. Thank you all. I want to say, so, go ahead. I just wanted to thank you all for oh, coming. No, no more questions right now. We're going to hold on. Nick is going to be around for a few minutes, but we have several people who've been waiting to get him to sign a book or who need to leave. And so we're going to end the official part of this right now. Um, I also want to mention before too many more of you leave that next April, I know it's a ways away, we have a person who has written what is considered the definitive book right now about ADHD. His name is Alan Schwartz. He was a New York Times reporter. He was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. He was on Diane Green yesterday. This guy is the most authoritative person you're likely to hear in this neck of the woods. So these flyers are on the table in the back. You can take one before you leave. Um, I want to really thank Dr. Nicholas Carderas for being here tonight. <laughs> for the work that he does, of which there is no better and um, for being able to, to share his story. I hear what you're saying about organizing and maybe you know some sort of letter to the editor or some sort of group thing could come out of something like this. And I'm sure maybe for those of people who might be interested in contacting you or keeping in touch on your website, or can they do that? Can you have a, a mailing list or? My email is on drcardaris.com. I have a website. My website has all the research on it, and my website has a lot of resources as well. So it's www.drcardaris.com. The, the other thing is, for the people you know who missed this talk tonight, within about a month, it will be posted on the library's website. A lot of people don't know that you can actually go on the library's website, myrml.org, and there's a you can click on the events column, you can go down, watch library events online, and you will be able to see tonight's talk. If you have trouble accessing that, call us up. If you need a copy of the DVD, we'll make you one at some point. So those resources will be available for other people because we'd like other people to see it. It will also be on CTV, Channel 22, for those of you who live in this area. So thanks again to all of you, and thanks for coming.